And my name's Chuck Mortimer. I work on uh, identity and security here at Salesforce. I've been uh, doing that for about seven years. And um, if you've ever had to log in, probably you're working uh, your way through stuff my team works on. And Itzik's a member of the team. Itzik, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Itzik Koren. Uh, I run authentication here at Salesforce. Uh, my team is responsible for building different authentication services. So we do stuff like uh, single sign-on, API login. We also own the login page, right? So every time you log in, you're basically using authentication services. Yeah, so if you can't remember your password and have trouble logging in, come get Itzik's card after the show. I'll share you my just call him number. on the phone, he'll yeah. get you logged in. It'll be good, so. Hey, a forward-looking statement. Uh, don't make buying decisions based upon anything that either of us will ever tell you. It seems like a bad idea. Uh, what I will tell you is uh, we're showing you all stuff that's there in the product today. It's kind of how you log in and how you integrate to Salesforce. Uh, we're going to try and demystify that, if you will. Um, uh, we'll also probably put a forward-looking statement that we're going to try and do a bunch of stuff live on stage. We're going to try and integrate four different application types. So we may mess this up. We'll see. It's all live demos. Uh, we may sacrifice some chickens. Uh, hopefully, we'll get through it. If you see us messing up, feel free to wave and tell us to do something better. Audience participation is uh, encouraged. So connected apps. Uh, well, hopefully, you're all familiar with applications that run on the Salesforce platform. These are things that you build in Visual Force or Lightning. You're building components. You're delivering these apps running on AppCloud. Okay? We also have this other class of apps. There's hundreds of thousands of them, actually. Uh, and they drive a, a fairly large percentage of the traffic that's coming to our login services and our API services. These are what we call connected apps. These are things that don't run directly on the Salesforce platform, but are connected to us over APIs. If you were at the last session, you actually learned a lot about how you can interact with our APIs. This is how you get through that first part. How do you authenticate to those APIs? How we, do we identify you? So you can think of a connected app as a way to describe to the Salesforce platform your app. That app may be a server-to-server -server app that's trying to do integration. It may be an app that you want to use single sign-on so you can build a cohesive user experience. It might be a mobile application or a tablet application. It's running off the Salesforce platform, but as you describe it to the Salesforce platform, we can show it to users. We can show it to administrators. We can display it in UI. We can a uh, put uh, access control rules on it. We can audit. We can put specific policy. So you tell us about our app, what it is, what you call it, what its logo is, what protocols it speaks, where it runs, uh, and then we can help control that for you from the Salesforce platform. That said, uh, there's a lot of options, aren't Lots there? Lots of options. Yeah. Uh, this is just some of the stuff that its team produces uh, as they work on connected apps. So there's lots of different ways that you might integrate apps to Salesforce. There's actually, what, 17 different ways to authenticate to Salesforce? All together? Yeah. yeah. We're not going to cover all those today, but we're going to try and go over some of the fundamentals and teach you how, as you're looking at uh, specific use cases that you want to drive in your organizations, you should be looking at our connected apps platform and using that to achieve your business outcome. So. So the first one we wanted to go over is single sign-on. And I'm going to quickly stop talking uh, and let Itzik take over and start driving, like actually building a single sign-on app. Yeah, uh, so uh, the first use case that we want to cover is using Connected App to provide single sign-on services to uh, external application. So this is, for example, our uh, SAML single sign-on yeah, portal. Yeah, let's, let's show you what the experience might be like. Okay. Let's say you wanted to build an experience where as an employee came in, uh, right here in the Lightning App Launcher, I can click this and look at this, I have access to lots of different applications. Some of these, like Wave, runs on the Salesforce platform. Others don't. So for instance, if I wanted to get to Concur, I can just click a button and I'm seamlessly logged into Concur. The user didn't have to log in again. So we have these services here for describing these applications and providing single sign-on. That was all done with an industry standard uh, known as ITSIC. SAML, yeah. So let's start with SAML. If you're not familiar with the SAML protocol, this is how it works in a nutshell. Uh, these are the two main entities that we have. On the left side, we have yeah, the uh, identity provider. This is basically Salesforce. This is where you're going to manage your user identity. This is also where you're going to run the authentication services. On the right side, you have the uh, service provider. This is essentially the web application, the cloud application that you want to integrate with single sign-on services. Now, the way that it works is that when user wants to go and log into the service provider, they open the browser, they type in the service provider login URL, and then the service provider will automatically redirect them to the identity provider. 
the identity provider uh, might ask them to authenticate if the user don't, doesn't have a live session with the IDP yet. And then on successful authentication, the IDP will send message back to the service provider. Now, this message is digitally signed. Uh, and it includes uh, different information about the user. It might include things like the user username, his email address, could include a uh, unique identifier and also other custom attributes. So now the service provider can use this message to identify the user and log him in, right? But before the service provider can log in the user. Well, so uh, example use case may be what we just saw, sign in and concur. Correct. I think that's a really important thing to point out about SAML is this is a long, well-standing uh, or well-deployed industry standard. It's been around for well over 10 years at this point, so you're going to find lots of existing applications can support this standard. And this is a good reason why you might, if you're trying to deliver SSO use cases, either into Salesforce, because we can be the service provider, or out to other applications, why you might look at SAML. We can act as that IDP to existing applications that you have, or to existing platforms. Maybe you have an application server you're trying to sign somebody into. SAML is a great thing to look at. Correct. But you do have to figure out how you trust the two of them. Exactly. So before the service provider, Concord, for example, can uh, receive the uh, message and let the user in, it needs to verify that they, it trusts the IDP, right? We don't want service provider to accept messages from any IDP. So, uh, sorry. Uh, um, trust between service providers and IDP is established offline by exchanging some metadata information. Here, for example, you can see the IDP uses a private key, encryption key, to uh, encrypt or sign the uh, message, and also generate a public key or certificate and share it with the service provider so the service provider can now verify the signature on the message. So essentially, the IDP and the SP exchange some information to say, here's where I want my identity to be provided from, and the SP says, here's who I trust to give me identity. Does that sound about right? right. And that's, off that's done offline, right? This is the registration process. You do it once for every uh, service provider. Let's just show it. Yeah, so uh, in this example, we're going to uh, provide single sign-on services from Salesforce into a simple uh, SAML application. We are going to use. Uh, You're all set to go, App Manager. <laughs> where is my SP? Yeah, so yeah. this is our uh, simple SAML application. Uh, you can go and try it. It's uh, publicly available. You don't, not, you don't need to sign up. Uh, and as you can see, uh, this uh, simple SAML service provider already lists here the different metadata information that needs to be shared with the uh, IDP. Here, for example, you can see the entity ID. This is the unique identifier uh, of this service provider. The ACS URL, for example, is uh, the endpoint on the service provider that will receive the message back from the IDP, right? So we need to go and tell the IDP where to send the message back. Yeah, so the these may sound like gibberish because it was done when we did XML standards, you know, 10, 15 years ago. The easy way to think about it, entity, entity ID, what I call myself, ACS URL, where I'm running, start URL, where you want users to go to begin with. Now we're going to go teach the Salesforce platform about that. So why don't you head to App Manager? Yeah, so the first thing we need to do, we need to create a connected app, right? So go, let's go to the App Manager under the setup, and here let's go and create new connected app. Now note this exists in Salesforce Classic UX as well. We're demoing in Lightning, but all these capabilities are there no matter which interface you're running. So. Yeah. And we're going to call it awesome because it's awesome. Uh, we need to give it an API name. Uh, need to provide your email. Uh, and the next thing that we need to do, we need to go and enable the SAML option for this connected app. Now, here, this is where you need to register the metadata information from the service provider. So let's go back to our service provider, grab this information here. So this is normally something you'd work with the owner of that application, and they'll give you this information, and you'll register it with Salesforce. We're then going to take the information from Salesforce and give it back to the application owner. So there's this exchange of metadata that we were yeah. talking about. So now that we teach our IDP about the service provider, the next thing that we need to do is save. Why don't we call this really awesome? <laughs> awesome one. And the next thing that we need to do is give them both uh, one and one there. So Always now, delete your data that yeah. you did in the test demo before you do the demo again. So, yeah. So now the next thing we need to do, we need to authorize a user to be able to access this app. So we're going to flip yeah. to the management side of the connected app. Now, this management side of connected app is where you can set uh, access and security policies. 
right? So for example, you can require user to log in with a second factor of authentication every time they try to log into the service provider. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, add, assign this app to a profile. Yeah, so picture what Itzik has done is describe the application to our platform. This is where we're going to send single sign-on messages. Now what he's saying is here's who we're going to allow to actually do that. And this will do things like cause it to show up in the application launcher. When they actually try and go through single sign-on, it's going to say, hey, let's stop and check to make sure we understand who this is, it's Itzik, and that he's allowed to do this operation. So Great. you can do this with both profiles and permission sets in the platform. Okay. The last thing that you can do is optional. You can add additional attributes, right? So the IDP would send message back to the service provider with some standard attributes. You may want to send more information to the service provider. You can do that by just going to the custom attribute here section. OK, and then you can select uh, standard or custom field from your org, right? So let's say that I want to send my phone number or the user phone number. And here I can select different, uh, again, Attribute. So that's my share your phone number. And hope you're okay with that. Okay, so we're almost ready to uh, uh, kick off the single sign on. The last thing that we still need to do is we need to uh, teach the service provider about the IDP. So, what we're going to do now, we're going to register the IDP metadata with the service provider. There are different ways to do that. Probably the easiest way to do it is every SAML connected app automatically expose the metadata information. If you scroll down, down here, you will find the metadata discovery endpoint. And let's grab this uh, URL. Yeah, let's just open a new tab and see what it looks like. Yeah. Notice you can also download this as a file as well. And as you can see, this is a simple XML file that includes all the metadata information that is required for the service provider. So now let's switch to our service provider. Let's provide this metadata information. And now, during login, what's going to happen is first, Service provider is going to inject and register this information and then kick off single sign-on. Now, let, let me pause here. What we're showing you is a demo. Normally, what would happen is behind the scenes, your administrator would tell your application about its identity provider, and this is nothing an end user would ever see. Your end user would just come to the application and see a login button. They click login, and it gets sent to the identity provider. Because this is a test app and we wanted to set it up quickly, we're actually showing you the configuring of the metadata that would all be behind the scenes. Your users would really feel something that's seamless. They click a button, they get sent to the Salesforce login page, they log in, and they're in. So we'll watch yeah. Itzik hopefully type his password well. Yeah, but before that, you can see that during the authentication, I get redirected to our IDP. This is my Salesforce org. And you can notice that this login is not a standard login. So what we've done here, we enable my domain. My domain allows you to uh, customize your login page for your uh, uh, org. Uh, and that allows you to brand your own login experience, right? So you can have your own custom domain. You can have your custom colors, uh, icons, and you can even customize the ad here to the right. So now I'm going to log in as a sysadmin, because this is the profile that is allowed to log in. And as you can see, I am now successfully logged in and also successfully single sign on into my service provider. And notice it that attribute that he configured declaratively using formula has been shared with this application. So you can then personalize the attributes that you're sharing with your connected apps. Why don't okay. you log out and log in again, and we'll show the just click log out. And now, since Itzik's already logged in, if he just hits log in, this is what your user would experience with single sign-on. Just a quick redirect, and boom, they're in their application. So you can use this to build what we showed you originally, which is sort of this portal of applications that your users can jump to. This is actually what we do at Salesforce. So when we start our day, we go to a single sign-on portal and jump to any application that we need. Or you can build like a cohesive sales or support offering. If you're, say, trying to pull applications into console, like as your CSRs are uh, working on cases, you don't want them logging in to get to back office information. Just use single sign-on in order to pull that through so that they can really be quick and timely about answering customer questions. Right. So the next uh, use case that we want to cover is uh, using OAuth and OpenID Connect to uh, implement single sign-on and API integration. So here, for example, you can see this is a single sign-on using the OAuth-based or OpenID Connect protocol. Now, uh, you might have a website or web application that is hosted outside of uh, Salesforce. Uh, you can now embed the Login with Salesforce button into your website login page and allow your user to log in with their Salesforce credential. Right? In this way, you can hand over all the heavy lifting authentication services to us 
So you don't need to implement your own authentication service. So SAML gave you SSO. Now we're really talking about that next level. We want SSO and the ability to talk back to Salesforce. So you can see dataloader.io is then asking, like, uh, do you allow your data to be accessed by this platform? So for that, we're going to use introduce two new things. Uh, the first is something called OAuth, which is uh, a modern standard for kind of how you delegate access or grant authorization to API applications to talk to your platform. So if you've ever gone through like a login with Google Flow or a login with Facebook Flow, these are fundamentally things that uh, are using OAuth underneath. You send the user over, they come back, and then that application can get API access to this. Layered on top of that is another new standard called OpenID Connect. This gives you the properties of SAML. You, you get that single sign-on capability with OAuth layer on top of it. So picture you have both SSO and the ability to talk back to the platform in order to talk to APIs. And that is really powerful, because not only can you identify the user, but you can actually act on the user's behalf or pull data back to enrich that application. So let's take a quick look. You're going to find that this is very similar to SAML, but instead of all the nasty XML and like 20 different timestamps and all the crazy XML signature wrapping stuff you have to deal with, uh, it's really simple. It's just uh, JSON, basically, is the easiest way to describe it. HTTP and JSON. So why don't we yeah. walk through OpenID quick? Yeah, so here during registration, basically, the authentication provider, Salesforce in our case, we generate credentials. You will be able to see them soon. And then uh, ex uh, end over them to the client application. Now, during runtime, user, when they want to access your client application, they go to the client application. The client application would automatically redirect the user to the authentication provider, which will ask them to authenticate. In return, the authentication provider will send code back to the client application. Now the client application can make another API call and uh, exchange the code with access and ID token. Once the client application gets this access and ID token, it can use it to start making API call, right, and start fetching data for this user. So let's radically simplify that. We redirect the user over to Salesforce. They log in, just like we saw with SAML. What they get back is this one-time use code. And they can call Salesforce and get back a Salesforce session uh, and the user's identity, so in a standardized way. So to do that, why don't we head back to the App Manager. And we will go to Awesome 11 here. And we need to start layering in some OAuth information. Yeah, so the first thing we need to do, we need to enable OAuth for this connected app. The first thing that we're going to do is we need to register the callback URL. Callback URL in OAuth is very similar to uh, ACS URL. This is basically the endpoint on the yeah. client app. This is where the application runs. This is where I want you to send my single sign-on messages. It's important we just don't send them anywhere, because this is your user's identity that you're talking about. So we pre-register everything. Okay. It's, it's going to head over to our similar testing app. This is our OpenID Connect testing app, so you can kind of visualize what's going on. And why don't you grab your callback URL and yeah, register. Yeah, so here's the callback URL for our client application. Let's grab it. Let's, let's grab the entire string. Let's go back here. OK, the next thing that we need to define is scope. Scope in OAuth allows you basically to uh, define the access level or grand, uh, find grand access level. So if, for example, you're building client application that only interacts with user data over API, you probably don't want to allow the client application to access UI components, right? So let's go now and select some of these scopes that selects API scope, uh, the basic information scope, and also the open ID or the ID uh, scope. And that's it. Now we can save this. And as you can see, upon saving, the application automatically generates this credential, the key and the secret. So what we need to do now, we need to go and register this information with our client application. So let's grab this. Once again, this is stuff you do all behind the scenes. You with the identity provider working with, your, uh, with the application or the service provider, you're going to provide them this metadata. What we're doing now is basically giving an identity to this application. This, identity, this application actually has an ID and a secret, which means when the users are using this application, we now have the context of not only the identity, but also the app that they're using. We can give it different policies. We can uh, send different apps for it. Just keep yours yeah. ready to go. OK, good. So we're ready to kick off OAuth or basically log in. Now the user, you can notice that the user was not asked to uh, log in because he's already logged in with this IDP, right? We just logged in on our on our, on our and during the, our and they were demo. also authorized because uh, we picked up 
that authorization information uh, that he'd set before on the profile. So you get that same single sign-on experience. Correct. As, it, as you can see, this is the response that come back from the server. This is the authorization code. So now the next step is we're going to exchange this code with the access and ID token. So let's do that. This is basically a back channel API call to the server. And now you can see here the uh, response they get back from the server. Here you can see the, it's a JSON format with a couple of attributes. The first one is the access token. As you can notice, this is an opaque string, right? There is no details that you can get from this access token. But this access token can be used as a session, essentially, right? So you can start using this access token in your API call and start calling to our server and fetch user information. And down here, you can also see the uh, ID token. So an ID so is token is a signed piece of JSON that's going to be a lot like the SAML assertion you had said. We've decoded it over here. You can see it's got an audience. This is the app I was targeted at. It's got some timestamps. This is how long it's good for. And it's got the user's identity. So you can use this to process single sign-on with that. So you now have the two key things. You have the, who the user is and a token, this access token, which is really just a Salesforce session you can use to talk back to the APIs. And if you click Next, you can see us make some API calls, including uh, one for a standardized set of attributes about this user. So also in OpenID Connect uh, are a bunch of standard user attributes. Uh, so you can see we've pulled back the user's nickname and their given name and their email address and their profile picture. And if you scroll down, uh, you'll see we've also got the URLs for where you could go talk to the APIs. So that if you go hit that, you can see, oh, here's where the SOAP API is running. Here's where the REST API is running. So putting these two things together lets you have both SSO and API access. And let's get moving, because we're yep. tracking a little low. OK, so that was our, that. Now what if you wanted to do this with mobile? Well, you've got all the basics now. So mobile basically just uses OAuth. When you pull up Salesforce One, when you pull up any application that's connected to our platform, most likely it's using OAuth in order to log in. And we just went through an OAuth flow there. That was OpenID Connect. OpenID Connect just added in that ID token and those standardized user attributes. With OAuth, uh, though, in a mobile context, I mean, a bunch of the stuff there gets kind of hard. Like, how do you protect those tokens on a mobile device, et cetera? So the best thing that we can do is advise that you use our mobile SDKs and our mobile offerings. On one side of the spectrum, you might have Salesforce One, where you're building apps and just deploying them into Salesforce One. But on the other end of the spectrum, you have custom mobile apps. And if you use our open source mobile SDKs, all of the controls that you have with Salesforce One will automatically be applied to those mobile SDK apps. The ability to do single sign-on, apply policy, et cetera. So we're going to show you quickly how easy this is. Uh, with any luck, we'll get through it. I'm going to do two things here. One, I'm going to uh, edit our app again. And I'm going to add in a few more permissions, just because we want to get crazy. Let's just give them all out. Why not? And uh, I've up my scopes here. You can choose which scope of access you want. I'm going to hit Save. And now we've got some additional scope of access for our app. I also actually want to edit this again and say, hey, maybe I'm a mobile app. If you scroll down here, there's lots of things we can do with mobile apps, such as enable you to send push notifications to those mobile apps, host private binaries for you so users can download those mobile apps. Uh, in this case, I'm going to say pin protect my mobile app. And if I save this, you'll now see that if I go to the manage side, we also have some additional policies uh, for this app. I can now say require a pin after 10 minutes of inactivity. Why don't we make our pin four digits long? Uh, the mobile SDK will take care of enforcing all of these policies for you. So we've got our app set to go. Why don't we head back? And I'm, uh oh. Why don't we head back? There we go. And I'm going to grab my connected a app ID so that we can teach the mobile SDK about this. And we will delete the thing so we don't do what we did before, which is try and do the same demo app. I'm going to run something called force iOS create. And the other thing I'm going to do is blow this up so you can see it better. So I'm going to create a native app, although you can see we support lots of different types. We'll call this awesome. Uh, I'll just put it uh, right here in this directory. We'll say it's com.salesforce, my awesome company. And I'm going to put my connected app ID in here. And I'm also going to uh, put my connected app callback URL in here. 
and uh, we will spin up an app for you automatically. So while this is working, because we don't actually know how long it's going to take, uh, <laughs> given the network, uh, we are going to switch over and show you the last use case and then hopefully loop back around. But what's going to happen with this is it's going to generate a full Xcode project for you. And all you really have to do is hit build, maybe teach it your custom URL, but hit build and it will become this application for you. All of the login, all of the policy enforcement, all of the protection of your data will be done automatically for you. You can just focus on building your app. So while that's working, we're going to switch and talk about the last one, which is server to server integration. Okay. Yeah, so sometimes you may have uh, integration between two servers, right? It could be a service that runs on AWS and w once on every day goes and fetch data from Salesforce, or the other way around, right? It could be uh, some batch process on Salesforce that go every hour and fetch data from Google Platform, right? So in this case, using OWOT web server flow that we've seen before doesn't make sense, right? You don't have user that can authorize, right? You need to somehow you need to find a way to authenticate this client. Uh, and for this, you can use the JotBear flow. In JotBear flow, we're basically uh, replacing the username, password, or the user credentials with certificates. So the way it works during registration, the client application would generate a private key and a corresponding certificate and share the certificate with the uh, authentication provider. Now, the, every time the client application needs to get a, an access token, instead of asking the user to authorize and authenticate, uh, to the authentication provider, it basically sent a JSON web token that is signed with this private key. Now, the authentication provider can use the certificate to verify the signature, authenticate this request, and send back the access token to the so client. The easiest way to describe this is single sign on for the API. This application can generate a chunk of JSON, sign it, and send it over the API, and they'll get a session back. You don't need to store users' passwords. You can do this for integration users. You can do this for act on behalf of or impersonation use cases. So it's pretty handy. You want to show them quick? Yeah, so now we're going to show a, a live demo. And I'm going to show you server-to-server -server integration between two different sets of orgs, right? So the first Just org go do it. You got two and a half minutes. OK. <laughs> so the first org that we have is uh, the org, the issuer org. This is uh, where our DF, or sorry, Awesome 11 app is. And we're going to log into another org. Uh, and this will be the client application. Uh, so the first thing we need to do, we need to generate this uh, pair of keys. So I'm going to uh, certificate and key management here, generate these keys. OK, create self-signed certificate. What it does, it's basically generating a private key and corresponded public key. Okay, you can also it. bring your own certificates to the platform. So if you want to upload your own cert and your own private key, you can do that. We'll just protect it for you. OK, so it's now. Go ahead. Okay. It's, it's going to download this now, and I'm just going to yep. punch through as quick as you can, and I'll give you the Yeah, <laughs> and then let's go back to our awesome app, and let's upload the certificate. So when he clicks on digital signatures, he's going to be able to choose and upload his signature. Just hit downloads there. Uh, and then if you click, yep, there you go. So uh, when ITSIC does this, it's now registering that cert. And this is basically going to say, OK, this is the public certificate. The, anybody who has the private key can now prove they own that private key by signing this JSON message. Okay. Over uh, in your developer org, you want to show them the demo then? Yeah. So now, basically, I, want to, I need to generate this, uh, construct this JWT, sign it with a certificate, and make the HTTP call to get the access token. It sounds like a lot of work. What we did in winter, uh, in this winter 17 release, we uh, deliver a bunch of uh, Apex method that allows you to do all of that very fast. So if you go here and now look into this pod sample, right, you can notice that we have new JAT and JWS object. And all you need to do now is just construct the JAT. This is the claims that you need to provide to this JSON request. Uh, here is an example of, uh, you see, one single line of code to go and sign. Uh, this JWT with the certificate. And we also provide you an API call to go and make this uh, OAuth request and uh, send the JSON and get the access token back. So long story short, it's like once you fire up the demo, uh, long story short, if a lot of that sounded like gibberish, we've built APIs into Apex that will automatically do this for you. Go look in the auth namespace under Jot, and you can just simply construct messages for here's who I'd like to act on behalf of. 
and we'll take care of formulating that, signing it for you, protecting the key associated with you, and doing the exchange with the other platforms. And this is an open standard, once again. Everything that we've been talking about are open standards. So when we do this, you can actually talk to Google or you can talk to Box using this as well. Yeah, and we still need to provide some input to this method, right? So for example, we need to provide the issuer, right? Issuer is the, basically the target application that is going to issue the access token. So we need to provide the client ID. Uh, we need to specify the certificate you're going to use to sign this request. So let's do this. And here I have a, a simple uh, lighting application that basically invoke this method. So the get JOT will basically retrieve you a JSON, right? Uh, now let's play. sign it. Let's sign it now. Yeah, you need to define, yeah. You need to specify the remote site setting. We told yeah, you we something told you to go wrong. <laughs> everything is not going to work. Uh, but that's the idea, right? You can use all this method to easily uh, create the JAT, send it, and get the access token. So now, once you get the access token, you can start talking to the other server. OK, well, one demo out yeah. of four going bad isn't. Let's see how mobile's doing, and we'll kind of wrap up there. Hey, look at that. Looks like we have a new mobile app. Let's go into. Uh, our, actually, let's just go into Awesome and look at this. We can say Open Awesome. We'll open our workspace and up comes Xcode. And lo and behold, we have a brand new project. And I can hit Build on this. And right out of the box, it's going to build a full mobile app for you and uh, be up and running. So all of the things related to our connected app uh, will be enforced. Now, the one thing that you're going to want to pay attention to is that when this comes up, you'll notice that this is going to go straight to login.salesforce.com. Okay. With any luck. Come on. Oh. Well, two demos fail. We got so close. <laughs> the dangers of doing live demos. So it looks like we've got a scope error, uh, and we didn't get the scopes right when I registered them. But um, we're super close. Uh, what we recommend then is a few follow-ups. Um, the first is when to use what. So here's a quick chart. If you're looking at single sign-on, look at either uh, SAML if you have an existing app that uh, might support an existing standard, uh, or OpenID Connect. If you're trying to build it yourself, don't try and build SAML. It's really, really hard. If you're trying to build it yourself, try and build OpenID Connect. It's really, really easy. We got it right kind of the second time around. Uh, API access, if you're doing that, either look at OAuth. If you're building a mobile app or a server-to-server -server app where the user is going to be there, or if you're using a single sign-on like we showed you and want API access, look at OpenID Connect. Mobile SDK is the best thing you can do for mobile because you don't want to try and engineer all of that in your mobile client. And then check out the job bearer flow for server to server. And with that, we wanted to say thank you. Here's a, something you can take a picture of. We'll be around uh, to answer questions. Appreciate everybody coming. And uh, we got close, so you know, oh, the demos almost worked. But it's always cool to demo stuff live on stage and you take some risks, and we got close. So thank you, Itzik. So, yeah. yeah, thank you.